In this lesson, we're going to learn about the strengths of acids and alkalis. So what does it mean when we have a strong acid? And what does it mean when we have a weak acid? Uh, we're going to learn also about the concept of pH and then indicators. So if you can recall, an acid is a substance that dissociates or ionizes in water to produce hydrogen ions. Right, that's the key um, ion that gives acids its characteristics. Um, in contrast, an alkali uh, dissolves in water to produce hydroxide ions. So this is the ion that gives alkalis its characteristic properties. So, so what exactly do we mean by a strong acid versus a weak acid? is that the strong acid will ionize completely in aqueous solution whereas a weak acid will only ionize partially so again what do we mean by ionize completely and ionize partially is that uh, imagine we have 100 units of hydro hydrochloric acid which is a strong acid it will break apart completely it will dissociate completely to give 100 units of hydrogen ions and 100 units of chloride ions so this is so therefore it qualifies as a strong acid because all of it dissociates whereas for ethanoic acid if we have 100 units of uh, ethanoic acid it will only produce or out of this 100 units of ethanoic acid only one unit will actually undergo dissociation to form one unit of hydrogen ions and one unit of um, ethanoid ion this is called ethanoid ion okay so what happens to the remaining 99 uh, units of ethanoic acid it remains as the unionized form all right so 99 units will remain as the unionized form all right so you can imagine if an acid only ionizes partially it only produces a little bit of hydrogen ions so therefore we call it a weak acid so the same applies for a strong and a weak alkali a strong alkali ionizes completely in a good solution whereas a weak alkali will only ionize partially so again, if I have 100 units of alkali uh, uh, sodium hydroxide, it will ionize completely. All 100 units of it will ionize to form 100 units of sodium ions and 100 units of hydroxide ions. Whereas for ammonia, ammonia is the classic example of a weak alkali. If I have 100 units of it, maybe only again one unit will dissociate. Well, one unit will ionize to form one unit of ammonium and one unit of hydroxide ions. What happens to the remaining 99 units? It will remain as the unionized form. So it doesn't produce hydroxide. Um, the remaining 99 will not contribute to any alkaline properties. Now, it's very important at this point to discuss the difference between strength and concentration. Why is because many students um, tend to mistaken strength to be dependent on concentration or to be related to concentration and vice versa. Now, um, let us look at the definition of each before uh, we see whether there's any relation between the two. As we have seen, strength of an acid on alkali depends on the extent of ionization. So whether it ionizes completely or whether it ionizes partially. Whereas concentration depends on the amount of the acid or alkali dissolved in solution. Alright, so this two has absolutely no relation to each other. Meaning if I have a high concentration of an alkali, it doesn't make it a strong alkali. Alright? Or, or 
if I have a strong alkali, it need not be very concentrated. So concentration can be controlled by men. So we can change the concentration of an acid or an alkali, but strength of the acid is cannot be controlled. Or rather, um, when we look at a particular acid, the strength is already fixed. We cannot change the strength of an acid without changing um, the structure of the acid. So as mentioned, these two terms are not related. Um, so we can have a high concentration of a weak acid, but that doesn't turn it into a strong acid. It is still a weak acid. Similarly, we can have a very a low concentration of a strong acid, but that doesn't make it a weak acid. It is still a strong acid. In the next part, we're going to learn about pH. What exactly is pH? pH is a scale for measuring how acidic or how, how alkaline a substance or a solution is. So it contains a range of numbers ranging from 0 to 14. So 0 stands for strongly acidic, whereas 14 stands for strongly alkaline and right smack in the middle of 7 it stands for a neutral so we have a neutral solution um, when we have a pH of 7 so if you can recall what makes an acid acidic would be hydrogen ions so when we have a strongly acidic when we have very low pH values we actually have a high concentration of hydrogen ions but does that mean that we have no hydroxide ions present answer is no all right under all conditions as long as something is dissolved in water we always have uh, some hydroxide ions present now why is that so is because water um, whenever we have water present water can undergo a reaction called self ionization to produce hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions so no matter how acidic a solution is as long as we have some water present there will be some hydroxide ions that are present the reverse is true for a strongly alkaline solution if you can recall what makes an alkali alkaline is that it contains hydroxide ions so a highly alkaline um, solution would contain a high concentration of hydroxide ions but does it mean that it contains it doesn't contain any hydrogen ions answer is no it does contain a very low concentration of hydrogen ions um, that are formed from the self ionization of water how about neutral? Um, at pH 7, it's neutral means it's neither acidic nor alkaline. So it contains the same concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Now an example of a neutral substance would be that of water. All right. And uh, strong acids usually are found between 0 to 2, commonly, and then weak acids are usually between 3 and 4, and then strong alkalines are found between 13 and 14. whereas weak alkalines are found between maybe um, 9 to 10. Now these are only rough um, rough gauges. Why? It's because um, I can actually have a weak acid but a very 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 large amount of it causing the pH to go below 5 or 6 or, or even 4. 
Similarly, I can have a large amount of a weak alkali that causes the solution, the pH of the solution to go beyond 8 or 9. So whatever that I've shown here is just a rough gauge. So when we are given a solution, how exactly do we know what is the pH of the solution? We can actually use two methods. One is to use an indicator. The other one is to use a pH meter. Now, um, the use of an indicator is not unfamiliar. If you can recall um, the properties of an acid and alkali is that an acid will turn red limus, blue limus paper red and then an alkali will turn uh, red limus paper blue. So litmus paper is actually an example of an indicator. However, um, it's not the best indicator because it can only tell us whether the pH of the solution is below 7 or above 7. Now there are other indicators around, for example universal indicator. Universal indicator contains uh, or will produce a slightly different color for each pH. So in, in that case we can actually determine the pH of the solution more accurately. Some other examples um, would be methyl orange. Later we're going to look at the colors associated with these indicators. Methyl orange is important because um, in practicals this is the indicator that we're going to use for a type of practical called titrations. And then um, lastly is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is also a common indicator that we use for titrations but and uh, but in recent years, it has been banned in the lab, so we are no longer using it. Ne nevertheless, um, it's still worth knowing the colors um, for theory purposes. The next method is to use a pH meter. What is a pH meter? Um, it's something like a data logger that is connected to a pH sensor. Alright, so when we dip the sensor into a solution, the sensor will actually pick up the concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide ions and it will register as a number, for example 5.2 on the data logger. So a pH meter can actually give us a rather accurate um, value of the pH of the solution as compared to indicators. So these are the indicators that are um, important in our syllabus. We have litmus. As mentioned, litmus will only appear red or blue in acidic or alkaline conditions. For methyl orange, um, it's important to know that it's red when it's acidic and it's yellow when alkaline. For phenolphthalein, it is colorless when it's acidic and it's pink when it's alkaline. Now the more commonly encountered indicator in theory is that of universal indicator. All right, so it actually has the following colors for the following pHs. So how do we exactly remember that? You just need to remember that a strongly a very low pH will produce red for universal indicator. A strongly alkaline or high pH solution will produce purple for universal indicator and then a neutral solution will give a green color. All right, The variation in colors with pH actually follows the uh, colors of the visible spectrum or the colors of the rainbow.